So whether you're a Corbynite and you think uh, Britain was historically the bad guy and, and still is today, or whether you're a national conservative who, who would defend uh, maybe some aspects of the empire, that's irrelevant to me. I'm simply looking at the costs and benefits. Coming up on British thought leaders, Christian Nemitz says Britain's success is not built on the profits of empire. I'm simply saying purely on cost-benefit grounds, purely in economic terms, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't profitable, it wasn't a good idea. But a few elite families made enormous wealth from colonialism and taxpayer contributions. This uh, slavery compensation scheme, that is perhaps the perfect example of that. The trade, uh, the, the slave trade, the slave plantations, all of those activities were heavily implicitly subsidised because uh, they would not have been sustainable on their own. They needed the protection of, uh, of, of the army. Welcome to British Thought Leaders, I'm Lee Hall. Today I'm sitting down with Christian Nemitz, author and editorial director of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Christian, welcome back. My pleasure to be here. So there's a, a theory that's become more popular in recent times that Britain's economic success is based on you know, plundering, colonialism, the slave trade, etc. Your new book looks at the numbers and, and you know, tests this theory. What did you find? Well, the short answer is that the numbers are simply not big enough. So if you look at uh, the profits that were made in the British Empire through various activities, um, they were big enough to make some individual families fabulously rich. And that's why we can still see some of the, the mansions um, from uh, that were built by people who made their money through the slave trade and, and various other activities. Uh, so you see visible examples of that, but if you express that as a proportion of the overall size of the British economy, say, or the total investment that was going on at the time, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, of course, there was um, a lot of capital investment in the, uh, in the expanding industrial sector. And as a proportion of that, the colonial profits were just never anywhere near big enough to make a sizable contribution. Uh, you could at most say that they've, they've made a minor additional contribution, but even then, that doesn't take account of the cost uh, because empires are just very expensive to run. It could well be that uh, we, we can't come up with a definitive number. So I can't say the total contribution was plus 1% of GDP or minus 2%. Um, that I can't say, but it is not uh, implausible that it could even have been, the empire could well have been a net drain on Britain's prosperity. Right. I mean, international trade is a lot more prominent now than it was back in the time of wooden ships. Yes. What kind of contribution did non-domestic trade make to Britain's economy and then how much of that was with uh, empire countries? Yes, so today uh, if you add imports and exports uh, as a proportion of the size of the total economy, that's about uh, equivalent to 60% nowadays. So that's in a globalised world where we use um, container shipping and uh, digital logistics and, and all the technologies that we have now. Uh, of course, none of that existed in the 18th or 19th century. So there, it was more like uh, it, the, the share of trade as a proportion of, of the size of the British economy was less, much less than half of what it is now uh, because all those technologies weren't around. So trade, overseas trade was just not as important then, not nearly as important then as it is now and uh, for, for obvious reasons. And for that reason alone, um, the empire cannot have made such a decisive contribution. And even then, uh, most of that trade wasn't actually, uh, most of Britain's trade at the time, wasn't with the colonies, it wasn't within the empire, it was with economies outside of the right. empire. It was other industrializing economies that were in, in Western Europe uh, and, and, and North America. Those were the important trading partners of Britain. Right. I mean, some families, as you mentioned, did become fabulously wealthy through colonialism, the slave trade, etc., and the uh, compensations that were paid when Britain abolished the slave trade. Mm -hmm. And is this another case of you have this kind of elite few that have got rich, but the blame's being kind of put on Britain as the whole getting rich? Yes, that's exactly what it was. Uh, and, and this uh, slavery compensation scheme, that is perhaps the perfect example of that. 
Um, I have seen some historians who try to argue that uh, this, uh, this slave compensation money was invested in various industries and thereby built them up. But then who paid for that? That was obviously just a redistribution from non-slave owners to uh, slave owners. It was uh, paid by the, the British taxpayer and by, by people who bought government bonds. And it was just a pure zero-sum redistribution. So it would be, say, if I take 10 pounds uh, from you, uh, you're a bit poorer, I'm a bit richer, but uh, the total income within this room hasn't changed. And that's what this compensation program basically was. It was just a pure zero-sum redistribution from taxpayers um, to uh, well-connected um, business interests and I'd say most of the empire can be explained in those terms. So you had some well-connected businesses, some politically well-connected uh, business owners, business elites benefiting from it uh, at the expense of the majority of taxpayers and consumers. It kind of would have been the same in some of the plantations that are protected by British military forces, etc. That's taxpayer money yes. just going towards the profit of these people. That's exactly it. In that way, the trade, uh, the, the slave trade, the slave plantations, all of those activities were heavily implicitly subsidized because uh, they would not have been sustainable on their own. They needed the protection of, uh, of, of the army. And as a result of that, that goes beyond um, conventional national defense, uh, which uh, obviously in any economist uh, w would say that's that's a legitimate function of the state to protect uh, the borders of the country. But uh, if people want to venture into risky territories, uh, that's uh, well, at, at some point you have to say, well, that's that's your risk, that's your business. And um, by protecting those interests, uh, military spending in Britain um, became a lot higher than it was in comparable economies. And Britain was a high-tax economy by the standards of the time. Most of that was military spending. That was to, to prop up these various imperialist activities. So the average Brit who's in the, the steel mill or the coal mine, what benefits do they see from the empire? Um, well, you could say maybe it's a bit in terms of consumption. They, they would have had some exotic uh, products that uh, maybe otherwise uh, wouldn't have arrived here that soon or maybe, maybe uh, would have taken longer or it would, would have been more expensive, would have been more of a luxury good. But even there we have to say that, uh, we, we have to bear in mind that in some cases um, imperialist, imperial traders enjoyed protection and so for example sugar, refined sugar was more expensive in in Britain than it was on the other side of the English Channel uh, compared to uh, compared to the Netherlands, for example, and that was because of protections that they enjoyed. They could sell sugar at above world market prices, uh, above what market rates would have been. So. Um, yeah, it's hard to say whether the whether the average citizen really benefited at all. Uh, the, the only thing that we can say is that if, uh, say, if there had been no slave labor anywhere, if people um, had to pay market uh, rates for, uh, say, sugar cultivated with free labor under market conditions, yes, that would have been more expensive. So in, in consumption terms, uh, people may have benefited somewhat, but that's different from claiming that uh, that this is what financed the Industrial Revolution. So if, if Britain didn't get wealthy from colonialism, what was it around those times that made Britain so successful? Um, okay, that's... Uh, I don't know the, the exact answer. That's why uh, I try to avoid that in, in this book. Um, I'm saying we can rule out that it was the empire, we can rule out that it was the slave trade. That wasn't it, but what was it? I don't really know. Most economists would say that Britain just had better institutions at uh, at the time. So it was uh, political institutions, uh, the developing rule of law, that you had an independent court system, uh, which must have been very good by the standards of the time. But I suppose if we could, say, um, measure the quality of institutions in the way that we do today. There's all these World Bank measures that try to compare countries uh, on various metrics, uh, measuring quality of, of their institutions, where they would say uh, Switzerland is at the top and um, various sub-Saharan African countries will be at the bottom, those kinds of rankings. If that had been available then, they probably wouldn't have said that Britain is fantastic, just that it was better than the rest. So, so you had a system where 
you can make long-term investments and you can be reasonably sure that you will not get expropriated, uh, you will not get cheated, you will not get defrauded. There would be a basic protection of property rights. And that is just uh, most economists, uh, whether they're left-wing, right-wing, centrist, something else, would agree. That's Those are the basics uh, of... Um, of a functioning, prosperous economy. And then you may well have had some cultural factors uh, on, on top of that, so an appreciation of entrepreneurial activities. So if these uh, imperial endeavours weren't really making money, why did the nations continue with them for so long? Uh, a mix of reasons. So it would be like nowadays, you do get wasteful activities, uh, most, most uh, trade protection, most forms of, or pretty much all forms of protectionism, are wasteful uh, and uh, almost all economists, uh, again, irrespective of where they stand ideologically, politically, would agree that they're wasteful. But you always have some well-connected interests that are in favor of them, that benefit from them, and which lobby uh, for those protections. And um, in, in those cases, you have concentrated benefits. You have maybe 100 families that benefit from something or 100 businesses uh, that benefit from something, whereas the cost is more dispersed and less visible. And therefore, it's harder to mobilize the people who foot the bill than it is to mobilize uh, the people who benefit from the policies. So they are the ones who will be active about it, who will lobby politicians, who will uh, maybe try to sway public opinion or... Um, whatever it is, engage in various activities to try to uh, maintain and, and, and keep the, the policy. And it was probably that, that you had companies like the East India Company uh, just being politically well connected. They benefited from um, a trade monopoly that they had for a while. They wanted to keep that system. They wanted to keep the, the protections that they enjoyed. And it was just less visible uh, to the average Joe that they were the ones uh, footing the bill. And um, like any interest group policy, uh, sometimes it is maintained on that basis, that the beneficiaries are just politically more active than the people who foot the bill. And then there was, I guess, just a vanity aspect to it, that uh, you had statesmen, politicians feeling powerful, that you had all this patriotic rhetoric from the time, uh, that, that you have a, a small island uh, in northwestern Europe, a uh, or a medium-sized island in, in uh, the North Sea, ruling over such a big proportion of the globe. Um, I guess that is flattering to um, the national self-esteem. And you can then appeal to patriotic uh, sentiments and, and uh, sustain it in that way. So historian uh, Eric Williams wrote a book on this, this quite influential, uh, Capitalism and Slavery. And it seems this is the book that's quoted by people who support this idea that the Bren's success is built on the colonialism. I mean, do you think that that's a correct reading of what Williams was saying? Um, yes, yeah, so the Williams book was uh, the, the original basis for this claim that, uh, that, that it, was, uh, it was slavery, slave labor plantations that made Britain rich. Uh, he was the first one to say that in such a systematic way and, and not just assert it, but try to come up with, um, with actual evidence for it. He wrote uh, this book in, in the 1940s. And um, I'd say in, in a weak form, maybe that, uh, maybe that is defensible. Uh, that he was trying to uh, to trace uh, how these uh, plantation profits, uh, how they re-entered Britain and made a contribution to, to various in industries. Um, it's just that, as always, when such ideas become popularized, when they get taken up more widely, uh, they sometimes get turned into something more extreme. So Eric Williams wasn't saying that without slave labor plantations, there would have been no industrial revolution. Uh, he, he never said that. Uh, he, he never said that uh, the wealth of Britain is, is built literally on this, that, that Britain would be a poor country now if it hadn't had the, the slave labor plantations. That wasn't his argument. He said there were various um, funding streams into the uh, developing industrial economy, and one of those was uh, the slave labor plantations uh, in the Caribbean. It's just that that quite quickly was uh, turned into something more extreme, uh, namely in the 1960s when you had the, the, the student radicals of, of 1968. 
uh, when the student movements were glorifying uh, Mao Zedong in, in China and, uh, the, and then later the, the great proletarian cultural revolution and all that. And you had various philosophers connected to those uh, student movements, Jean-Paul Sartre, and uh, he picked up on this idea and, and he did say, uh, we all benefit from colonial exploitation. We all benefited from it. And, and he turned it into this more extreme version uh, that this is what built the West. Another uh, interesting thing you cover in, in the book is this idea from Adam Smith, the wasteful indulgence of slave labor. And could you talk us through that? Yes. Uh, so it was, um, firstly, it's generally true that these arguments about was the empire profitable, um, was, uh, was slavery profitable, these are not new arguments. Uh, people were debating this already in the, in the 19th century when the empire was still going strong, when it was uh, at its peak. And even in the 18th century, in, in, the, in the earlier stages, um, people were already having those arguments. And that's why I'm not claiming originality. I'm, I'm saying I'm just rediscovering a very old tradition of liberal anti-imperialism. It was the liberal anti-imperialists of the early days uh, from the British Empire who were already saying um, imperialism uh, is not just immoral, it's also bad economics. Uh, we, uh, it would fail a cost-benefit test. Uh, it, it's, it's, it makes us poorer than, uh, than we would otherwise be. And Adam Smith was one of those very early critics. Uh, he said it would be more beneficial for Britain to just trade with um, the colonies, or, well, in, in his world, if he got his way, they would no longer have been colonies. They, they would have become sovereign countries. Um, and uh, he also criticized uh, slave labor on similar terms. He said um, that uh, slavery had existed throughout history, but it's just a very, it's not uh, an economically productive way of, of, uh, of doing business for the obvious reason that uh, if uh, somebody who, who is coerced to work is not going to develop any initiative of their own. So it may seem that uh, it's free labor, but um, it's also going to be unproductive labor because if, if you're forced to do something, uh, literally at gunpoint, uh, you do only what you are forced to do. You, you have zero incentive to go even a millimeter beyond that. And uh, therefore, he said, um, this isn't a productive way to, uh, to, to run an industry. And this is countering the claims that, uh, that were later made, uh, the, the Williams idea is that it was the reliance on slave labor which made these plantations so profitable, whereas the Smith argument is uh, exactly the reverse. He says uh, the sugar trade was so profitable that they could afford to use an inferior production method because that's how he saw uh, slave labor. And he thought the reason why it existed was simply, uh, again, the vanity aspect, that if you are the owner of a slave plantation, it makes you feel powerful. And, and well, you are powerful in that, in that uh, regard. Um, and he thought that's, that's, that's the reason why it existed. Mm. I mean, your book has got a few hackles up. Um, I mean, you're not challenging the existence of the empire. You're not even saying whether the slave trade was right or wrong. You're saying, let's get some empirical evidence, crunch the numbers and see what it shows us. And why do you think some people take such umbrage with that? Um, I'd say partly it's, it's a conflation of two different types of, um, you could say, non-mainstream non views of, of the empire that, that are currently around. There are people who try to, what you could say, whitewash, I guess, the empire, empire revisionism, people who argue that the British Empire wasn't so bad, uh, that, that it had its benefits as well. Uh, that's not what I'm getting into. That's, that's an entirely separate debate. I'm simply saying f purely on cost-benefit grounds, purely e in economic terms, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't profitable, it wasn't uh, a good idea. And, um, but since both of these narratives go against the woke mainstream, I guess a lot of progressive commentators see them as um, maybe one and the same thing or, or at least overlapping uh, and thinking that this must be some way of trying to, to whitewash um, the, the empire. Whereas I'm explicitly saying, um, I'm purely looking at the economic effects what moral view you you take of this? That's not my concern. That's not uh, that's a separate argument. So whether you are Corbynite and you think uh, Britain was historically the bad guy and, and still is today, or whether you're a national conservative who who would defend uh, maybe some aspects of the empire, 
that's irrelevant to me. I'm simply looking at the costs and benefits. Um, but I guess a lot of the uh, the people who represent the, the progressive woke mainstream on this are either unwilling or unable to see that distinction, and they they just see, okay, this is a non-mainstream view. Therefore, surely this must be some kind of um, empire denialism, and uh, try, they try to mix that all into one. Um, so it's partly that, and then it's also the the general anti-capitalist zeitgeist that we have that uh, some people seem, seem to think that if you argue, as I do, that the empire wasn't profitable, that that's a defense, uh, that that uh, I'm somehow saying it wasn't so bad because people didn't make money from it, whereas I, th I think that's just bizarre. You can you can still condemn something as, as, as utterly immoral and uh, also point out that wasn't profit making. So the, the fact that uh, Britain didn't make money uh, um, from from the empire overall is in no way a defense. Uh, that doesn't make it any less bad. It's uh, it's it's not much of a. It's really not a not a defense unless you think unless you take this anti-capitalist view that the worst thing you could possibly do, the worst crime you could possibly commit, is to make a profit. Uh, if if you have that mindset, then of course saying. Uh, activity X, activity Y wasn't profitable is in some way a defense. Mm. It's almost like you know, letting the facts get in the way of a good kind of ideological narrative. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the reason why this uh, idea has become so prominent again in recent years is because of uh, the, the Great Awakening, um, the Black Lives Matter protests and uh, th that started four years ago. And it's in that context that uh, this Eric Williams idea, or, the, or the, the popularized version of it, that it has become such a big deal again. Um, I guess 10 years ago, if, if I had written this 10 years ago, only a couple of historians would have been interested in it. it. It would have been seen as a niche topic. The reason why it is not a niche topic now, the reason why it is such a big deal now, is because it fits so well into uh, this um, great awakening narrative. That's where the, the renewed interest comes from. And um, so that means it was the rediscovery of, of, of empire. It was hyper-political right from the start. It was set on the national agenda by uh, Black Lives Matter and, and various groups, um, spin-off groups uh, radiating from them. And uh, that's why, right from the start, you had an anti-Western, um, anti-capitalist narrative there. Christian Nimitz, thank you for joining us. My pleasure.